Welcome back to beyoungministry.blogspot.com to another blog and another podcast. Today we're in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, which reads, Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. That's 1 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 2, the number one overall theme in 1 Timothy is leadership. Something that was lacking in the church at Ephesus. There were some who were teaching false doctrine, fables, and genealogies that didn't edify anybody and weren't even godly. There were some who wanted to be teachers of the law of Moses, but They had no idea about the purpose of the law. In the church at Ephesus, there were some women trying to undermine God's pattern of leadership given us in his word. There were all kinds of people who were trying to rise to leadership because of money, position, prestige. In all of the epistles of Paul, he addresses the matter of false teaching from false leaders. False teaching is a very important matter because how we view God is the most important thing in our lives. The antidote of the false, obviously, is the true. So in today's text, the apostle turns our attention to the truth. In this one verse, the apostle gives us seven qualifications of the effective leader. Paul writes, now the overseer, is to be above reproach. The first qualification for those who lead is being above reproach or blamelessness. The Greek word for is to be is die, which is translated must. It is an absolute necessity that this man be above reproach or blameless. Coupled with this idea of blamelessness, is the Greek word ainai, which is a present participle of the verb to be. He must be in a present state of blamelessness. This does not mean he has never committed a sin in his whole life. It does not mean that in the past there wasn't something that was wrong. What it does mean is in the present he is blameless. And everything else that comes after this first requirement defines what it means to be blameless. Now, to be above reproach means to not be able to be held or taken hold of. In other words, you can't grab him as if he had done something deserving of apprehension. He is beyond accusation. There's nothing to accuse him of. He must be a man whose life is not mired by some sin, some vice, some evil habit, and be it an incident or an attitude. It could be anything that will cause him to be accused. He is to be beyond accusation. Now, this does not mean he is perfect, or there will not be times when he fails, and when he does something wrong. It does mean that his failure will not be his lifestyle. It does mean there is not a public sin in his life to which everybody could point and accuse him of accordingly. There is no issue in his life that is an ongoing problem of sin which would cause others to blame him and thus distract from the truth. The second qualification of a leader is he must be faithful to his wife. The apostle is not addressing his marital status. He has pointed out that a man's ability to be a one-woman man qualifies him to be a leader. The leader must not be sexually promiscuous. He must not be an, an adulterer. The third qualification for a leader is that he must be temperate, which means unmixed 
with wine or wineless. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, we read, Wine is a mocker and beer is a brawler. Whoever is led astray by them is not wise. <clears throat> to be temperate is to be wise. In Ephesus at that time, drunken orgies were part of the culture. The temple of Diana of the Ephesians was replete with the drinking of alcohol and all that went along with it. A leader is to be temperate, which is to be alert, watchful, vigilant, clear-headed. He never allows himself to be put in the position to get intoxicated. The fourth qualification is he must be self-controlled. The leader is the person who knows how to order his priorities. This word, self-controlled, carries with it the idea of a man with a sure and steady mind, who is not rash, but who is very thoughtful in his judgments. The fifth characteristic is he is respect respectable. He has the ability to be viewed as responsible. Others see the discipline of his heart and mind and the discipline of his duties and his actions. He is trusted to be responsible with the care of others. The sixth characteristic is he is hospitable. The Greek word that the apostle uses here Philoxenos, which means lover of the stranger, is a unique word in the New Testament. In Hebrews 13, 2, we read, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. <laughs> the example the writer of Hebrews uses is of Abraham and Sarah, who, in being gracious to serve a meal to three strangers, found out later, when looking back, that the strangers were none other than God and two angels, come in the form of men. I don't know about you, but wow. <laughs> wow. I wonder how many opportunities I've missed. The seventh characteristic is a leader of a leader is he is able to teach. This is the only qualification given in the entire list here related specifically to the function of an overseer. It means skilled in teaching. It is only used here and in one other passage, 2 Timothy 2.24. Only these two times is it used. He is to be a skilled teacher. This is the thing that sets deacons apart from elders, or I might say elders apart from deacons. The elder is able to teach. There's a marked skill in teaching that goes along with the other qualifications. And the man is highly qualified with the skill of teaching. My friends, I trust this podcast and this blog are useful to you in your walk with the Lord. If I can be of further assistance to you, don't hesitate to shoot me an email at beyoungministry at gmail. Dot com. Hey, have a great day.